Welcome to the Lend Academy podcast, episode number 120. This is your host, Peter Renton, founder of Lend Academy and co founder of Lend It. Today's podcast is sponsored by Fundrise. Fundrise investors earned over 10.8% average annualized returns during the second quarter of 2017. That's approximately 50% higher than a typical diversified peer-to-peer lending portfolio. How? Fundrise is the first investment service that makes the benefits of private market real estate investing available to everyone online. You can begin with as little as $500. Go to www.fundrise.com slash lendacademy to find out more. Today on the show, I'm delighted to welcome Scott Robinson. He is the founder and VP of Plug and Play Fintech. Now, Plug and Play have become a fixture in Silicon Valley. They've been around for many, many years. They've worked with some of the leading companies to come out of the Bay Area over the last couple of decades. But recently, they've had, the last couple of years, they've had a a focus on fintech, and Scott has really been leading that initiative. So I wanted to get him on the show, talk about what they do and how they're able to connect startups with you know established financial institutions. It's really a very sophisticated program that they operate. So we talk about that. We talk about what Scott looks for in a startup, the kind of services they're offering, and what he's seeing in entrepreneurship today when it comes to fintech. It was a fascinating conversation. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the podcast, Scott. Thanks for having me, Peter. Okay. So I like to get these things started by just giving the listeners a little bit of background about yourself, sort of what you've done in your career, particularly before you started a plug and play. Absolutely. So yeah, my name is Scott Robinson. I'm the founder and VP of Plug and Play FinTech. Uh, my career really started back in 2008, uh, actually amidst the, the financial crisis. I, I graduated early from UCLA and got lucky in landing a job prior to the significant market crash. And so my role was really actually managing roughly three to 400 retail locations around the country uh, on behalf of a a staffing agency. And so, as you might expect, it wasn't particularly the most exciting job, but (laughs) um, during the evenings, I I learned to code. So I began creating my own websites, and then I applied some of these new skills into a utility audit. And so it was that unique kind of utility security deposit audit that really, I guess, segued me into general technology. But I ended up uncovering uh, through this script I wrote that basically kind of matched square footage against utility consumption, a pretty significant embezzlement scandal. And so, you know, a few million dollars were embezzled and I left the company to go work at startups. And so starting in about 2011, I began working in startups that were kind of all over the place. I worked for a sports company, um, an education company, another uh, real estate company, and eventually made my way to plug and play where I started as a consultant. But you know, really the, the roads crossed for me in, in, in all of financial technology the summer of 2013. So that's kind of the, the main breaking point for plug and play and, you know, how we got into the space apart from some of our investments. So I, I came on at that point, both as a, you know, a Salesforce developer and kind of a marketing guy, but I was a big Bitcoin advocate. And so that summer we took over the world's first Bitcoin meetup and as an organizer and began to build out the community and um, later that fall, we would launch a Bitcoin accelerator program, which would then eventually become what it is today, an innovation platform where, where we've accelerated about 150 financial technology startups and work with about uh, maybe 40 of the largest banks in the world. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what was it that attracted you to Plug and Play specifically? Well, I think you know the, the Plug and Play story is unique in and of itself. Uh, it's the rugs to riches story, our CEO has a number of different businesses. So dating back to the late 90s, he had a good amount of commercial real estate on University Avenue, the main drag here in Palo Alto. And so as luck would have it, he had extra office space in some of these buildings and lent it out to uncreditworthy entrepreneurs. And those entrepreneurs included Larry and Sergey from Google, Max Levchin and Peter Thiel from PayPal. And uh, we were able to make a couple investments through the family office that turned out to be wildly successful. And so Um, That all really changed in 2006 when we took this facility in Sunnyvale, which is nestled right between Google and Apple. And, you know, since then, we've built out not only uh, a much grander kind of investment strategy and and portfolio, but we've layered in many different areas for which it helps the startup get to market faster at a cheaper rate and far more expedient for all parties involved. And and we try to pair them up with 
um, some of these larger corporations that are seeking technology needs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, and, and Lending Club I know is another another big name that uh, has come through come through plug and play. Um, That's right. So why don't we just take a step back and explain exactly what plug and play does today and how that's evolved um, over time. Like you talked about the, you know, just sharing office space, to, you know, renting office space to Google and, and PayPal or what have you, but what does it do today? Sure. So I think the one big takeaway from the early angel investing is that having a line of sight through a co-working space to the entrepreneur as an investor is incredibly important. It gives uh, a lot of, I'd say, insights as it relates to those that say they're going to do something and whether or not they execute thereafter. Just having kind of a focal point for which all the activities occur and a place for which, uh, you know, the community can gather and and build things is also very important. So today, Club and Play is, well, number one, one of the most active investors here in the Valley. As of 2016, I think we did about 160 investments globally. So our tickets usually between fifty thousand U.S. dollars up through about half a million. Um, we rarely lead, but that I'd say is our kind of first and foremost uh, activity here. Secondarily, is the co-working space. So in this facility in Sunnyvale, we house about 400, 450 startups. And then third, uh, we've layered in a, a lot of ways for which startups, um, you know, can gain access to both validation and, you know, build out their company much faster. So we think of ourselves for a couple of different reasons as positioned as both an, a business accelerator as well as an incubator. And so we have an early stage program called Startup Camp. Um, so we liken this to very much similar process for 500 startups or Y Combinator, a very early idea company uh, trying to really focus on what, what is the big product that they're building, path to market, things like that. And then in addition, we have now roughly 12 what we would call innovation platforms. And effectively, these are groupings of large corporations that are uh, sectored off, so they, they focus on a particular industry. And we offer, through our program, a non-equity requirement opportunity for startups to participate, engage, and hopefully land one of these partners, one of these large corporates, as a client. And so we run what we call our vertical programs twice a year per vertical. We have about 12 verticals. I lead the fintech and security divisions. Other divisions include IoT, mobility, retail, health, travel, insurance, and a few others. And each of these have roughly between 10 and 30 or upwards of 40 large corporations seeking technology that's both early as well as mature. So I think the three big differentiators between our platform and others is, number one, to the startup, um, we don't require equity to participate in the program. Number two, generally the entire program is free, so there's free office space, free engagements with the partners. Um, but number three, we're also opportunistically investing. So there's a chance for us to invest, but no requirement for equity. So that enables us to really work with some of the later stage companies that a corporate might see an opportunity to buy or acquire or use a, a product right off the shelf. Interesting, interesting. So I want to ask you about the starting of the FinTech uh, Accelerator there or the FinTech program inside Plug and Play. You know, clearly it, it, it's something that, uh, you know, you, you're, the, you're one of the driving forces of it. So tell us what, what made you decide to start on FinTech Vertical? Sure. So I think there were a few considerations as to why we wanted to, you know, get a little bit more active in fintech generally. I think number one, our portfolio, as you alluded to prior, included companies like Credit Sesame, Lending Club, PayPal. So we've had a history of successful investments in the space. And, you know, at the time, back in 2013, we pivoted my little Bitcoin meetup into basically my 20% project of starting and running a full-fledged Bitcoin accelerator program for startups. And so it was at a, a, an actual Bitcoin meetup in the fall where one of our founders alluded to the fact that this was an area we should be paying attention to, very similar to what we saw back in 2014. And so when that happened, you know, the reality was very clear that you know, Bitcoin was gaining a lot of traction. And then meanwhile, in the summer of 2014, we heard a number of strategics, including folks like USA, BBVA, and other large banks were shopping to make a strategic investment into some of the larger Bitcoin companies, including Coinbase, um, Zappo, or Ripple. And so it was at that time that we pivoted into a general financial technology program, but it didn't maintain a Bitcoin and blockchain track. And so that was very fortuitous for us, given, I'd say, in the past 12 months, we've seen this come very much full circle. A lot of folks asking, particularly relating to blockchain use cases and implications across not only financial services, but how that's branched out across many different industries and, and some of the areas for which you know, finance may beachhead, but we expect to have even greater value offerings elsewhere. And so 
since that start, we made the announcement of the FinTech program December 2nd, 2014. We launched our first class that February 2015. And today we're currently on batch six. So we've had roughly 160 startups globally accelerated. And we've also launched through the, the six batches here in the Valley an additional satellite office with BMP Pariba in Paris. And so there we'll be working out of Station F, Xavier Neal's large um, co-working space and you know, trying to basically build out a, a fully-fledged global tech transfer network for technology startups to find not only soft landings, but immediate hook-ins for building product. Right. So I want to just spend a little bit of time about that hook-in you, you talked about. And clearly, that's, it's a win-win. You can see for the startup, they, they might have a, a product or service that you know, a big bank is really going to be interested in and, and vice versa. A, a bank is obviously interested in what interesting things are happening in their space when it comes to technology. So how do you go actually about doing that? Because you obviously, you've got a, you've got startups there that you have companies that are die, would be dying to get an audience with someone like BBVA or USAA. How do you decide you know, when and how? What's the process like about bringing these two very different parties together? Well, yeah, I think you, you hit it right in the nail very different. These two parties speak different languages. They move at very different speeds. They have very different considerations. And so as with anything that's as significantly challenging, like entering a large corporation, you know, our approach has been iterative over the past two years. I think, you know, where we've been most successful and and really at the end of the day, we, we drive two value propositions to the partner. So the first value prop to the partner in this case is just really creative destruction and awareness avenues that enable them to have education of what is pending technology in the market that may impact business. And so think of this as a hedge, a means to uh, maybe seed the destruction of your own current business or uh, another way to stay privy to kind of what's out in the market. So that's a helpful kind of intelligence tool that the, these all these corporate partners benefit from based on not only our sourcing process, but as well as horizontally some of the feedback they receive as they work collectively and finding technology to bring into general finance. And, and so the second major value proposition is finding them technology that's ready today, um, meaning that they could buy, build, or acquire fairly quickly through a process of either outsourcing or you know, actually uh, licensing a technology. And so I'd, I'd argue about 80% of our startups in FinTech are based on a model of, of enterprise. So they're B2B or B2B2C, often white labeling. And so the process for us twice a year is through, say, the 35 to 40 financial institution partners, um, we identify from each of these respective business units within each of these partners two things. Number one is a technology area, and then number two would be a very specific use case as it relates to that technology. And so twice a year, we'll look at roughly 1,000 to 1,200 startups, um, both that apply to our website as well as technology areas that will actually actively source and, and you know travel around the world trying to find companies that are solving these problems. And in doing so, the process is basically a, a drill down from 1,000 applicants to 100 of the most relevant companies um, that, again, kind of vary in stage early through growth. And then these corporates will respond back and kind of hierarchically base which, which startups are most relevant and important. We, you know, we have quite a swath of different, uh, say, financial services focus areas. So, for example, some are more bent on wealth management, others on compliance, others more retail banking. And so... Through this basic filtering process, we try to check off each box for each need for each partner. And at the end of the day, we'll have, after the 100 startups are sent to each of these folks, basically a group of 50 companies that is uh, available for the startups to pitch at what we call our selection day. And so think of this as shark take on steroids. All of our <laughs> constituents are in a room, roughly 40 to 50 pitches. And from there, we'll offer up to 20 to 25 fintechs to join the program. And, and for the startup, it's, it's really helpful because, you know, having not only been on the other side as a founder and understanding that it's important to manage time, but, you know, you can imagine, like I said at the beginning, you know, the time function is a very important element as far as pace and, and kind of reconciling what the needs are from the corporate's perspective. And then on the other side, whether or not that's something the startup would be interested in. So, for example, some of the challenges we face is an early stage company might be very excited to build a unique product that's going to solve the exact use case to scope that the corporate's looking for. But mm -hmm. at the same time, they may not be able to serve a global Fortune 500 financial entity. And so there's a challenge there that we've seen with early stage programs, particularly those that are at idea stage or incubation. And then on the flip side, the later stage companies that have had a product in market for some time are often, it's very difficult to get them to create a custom solution for the partner. They're not an IBM, they're not an Oracle. 
and they're not going to you know charge you out the wazoo. But the point is, is at the very end of the day, you know, we try to build a spectrum so that you know the later stage, I'd say, legacy, you know, needs are met, and then the early stage, let's say, you know, like a new bank or a challenger bank that's looking for every solution, like a Frankenstein, can quickly come into Silicon Valley you know, build out, say, 20 or 30 features, white label everything, and then that Frankenstein bank's good to go. And that's very similar to what we've seen with one of our partners, Banco Original out of Brazil. So to that end, you know, we, we really try to, on the corporate side, also facilitate what I would argue is a very, you know, difficult and arduous process of reconciling all constituents in, in that actual corporate. So, for example, we often see, say, the banking innovation team find something shiny, shop it back to a business unit, but then the process for which that technology is actually brought into the company is very difficult. Mm-hmm. So our our main strategy, and, and frankly half my job, is facilitating a successful journey for the startup through the corporate. And so this means we generally have a four prong approach into working with any of these partners. So, you know, using BNP Pariba as an example, we'll work with three out of the eight board members. So Jacques to stay, for example. They, they will earmark internally all the resources, strategy, and some of the, you know, the objectives and KPIs as required. They'll make, make it clear within the organization. Culturally, this is something they are embracing. And of course, they're there to you know, give that stamp of approval or sign that check when required. Secondly, we'll work with the actual heads of business. So in this case, you know, for example, in BNP Priba, this first cohort we ran, we worked with 10 other business units. So this ranged from compliance, IRB, IT, insurance, et cetera. And so each of the heads of business will then kind of delineate a team of their own, so a task force group that will work with that startup over the course of that program for three months. And our main objective typically is to convert not only a pilot, but an actual product into a commercial offering. And so at the end of the day, that either means cost saving for the, the corporate partner by using better technology that's optimized that use case, or it's a brand new technology that augments their service offering. So it could be you know, brand new products or, you know, just like we saw with USAA about you know, a decade or two ago, remote check caching, maybe it's a brand new, you know, service that is very, very helpful from a concierge or a customer service perspective that will be, you know, launched within the company and then built out as an industry standard. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of reasons for which it's very difficult. And at the end of the day, we have, you know, a lot of consideration to the startup's time because at the, at the end of the uh, entire process, you know, startup, if they don't have time, can't execute on anything. And so we try to just make sure if, if you know, the parties don't seem to be working out, we get an early no, um, which saves both folks time. And then more importantly, if we do get a yes, we try to structure what that yes looks like, not only through the master service agreement, but more importantly, you know, with the shared objective of having some sort of commercial product live within that 12-month turnaround. Right, right. That's fascinating. Really fascinating. It's uh, You really are looking at two opposite ends of the spectrum there. So, and on that note, I'm curious, like, what are your bank partners or your the, the large companies, whether they're banks or insurance companies, what have you? What are they looking for, and how do you match that up? Like, I'm I'm curious to see if there's two different things happening here. What are the what are the areas of fintech that you're seeing the most activity when it comes to startups? And conversely, I mean, what are the areas of that the, the, these you know established you know, financial services companies? What are the areas that they're most interested in? Is there a match, or is it a bit of a mismatch? I'll be curious to hear your thoughts on that. So I, I think without us, it's a mismatch. That's for sure. I'd like to think that we augment and replace not entirely, but a good amount of the activities that would be helpful in the sourcing process for startups to corporates. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, generally speaking, the, the corporate has a pretty significant challenge just when it comes to talent acquisition. So laying the landscape out there, you know, arguably anyone that comes out of Stanford's comp sci program is basically worth about $5 million ahead at this moment. And so that type of talent, that demographic is not necessarily thinking top of mind, oh, I want to go work at X bank or, you know, Y payment processor. They're looking for an opportunity to deal with, you know, the largest data set in the world. They want to work with Google or Facebook or Apple or, or somebody along those lines for which you know, they feel as though they'll have an impact. So number one, I think the corporates have a very significant challenge in attaining and then, you know, keeping talent on board, um, particularly from the technical perspective. I'd like to say that, uh, you know, our, our friend, Mr. Skinner, put up a, a slide at our event back in May that said something like less than 4% of all C-level executives in financial services are technically adept or even aware <laughs> of, of you know, the technical requirements. And right. maybe that's not a requirement, but the point is, is that they're being filtered a lot of this information. And so the technical side and the technical talent now is, is not only creating a greater disparity between those that know and those that do not, but 
Further, those that are built or building things in this space aren't, you know, well aligned to participate with a lot of the innovation activities that we've seen in the banking industry. So there's a pretty significant challenge there. I think, you know, if I were to point out three or four areas of trends that I've seen a lot of activity, I think number one, I kind of said already, it's artificial intelligence. And in financial services, this really relates to three things. Initially, it's things like fraud, fraud detection, so behaviorally understanding the differentiation between uh, a user that is using their account and, say, somebody that's hijacked an account or otherwise. Secondarily, it would probably be mostly relating to customer activity, so customer acquisition and customer behavior. Indicators and kind of opportunities for which, you know, from a retail banking perspective, the brick and mortar could be kind of the hub for which the upsell to other services occur. Compliance is always a big space. You know, we, we do see a lot of, you know, interesting opportunity as it relates to some of the stress testing needs that uh, the government agencies are requiring. And I think generally speaking now, we're, we're getting a far more into a kind of a granular understanding of, of how compliance can leverage AI and, and what, you know, real-time audit may look like by way of blockchain and other kind of new technologies and market. I mean, the whole blockchain space, of course, I'll be, I'd say, probably biased in the sense just because of what I come from and what I've done. But you know, the whole ICO initial coin offering trend in the past year has been incredible to watch. So particularly with what we just saw come out of China's um, response and outlawing or, you know, the respective ICO process. So there's a lot of, I think, you know, things that are moving quickly. There's other areas that I think, you know, most folks are still struggling with. And generally, it's the same kind of problems retail generally is dealing with. Uh, how do you leverage brick and mortar, particularly in an ever-growing mobile environment? And you know, how do you mitigate against, say, the costs and reconciling each of your retail markets to be a, you know, a nice kind of slim running horse? So I think there's challenges there for most banks. And the irony, again, I think is, you know, as we see these tier one banks move out of certain markets and sell back these, these different kind of assets into the regional bank, I imagine and anticipate in the next 10 years, these, these legacy folks will be right back to take that business through a mobile offering. So that's another kind of major trend we're watching. But mm-hmm. You know, the other perhaps captain state the obvious trend is just the general kind of payments environment is shifting very, very quickly between uh, what we've seen with the MoneyGram pending acquisition and some other volumes that we're watching on the mobile chat and, and mobile you know, payment solutions. Quite an interesting time to be watching how payments are moving. So, Right. Right. And that just that brings up a question for me. I mean, are you... You know, the, the companies you've talked about are, uh, uh, you've, you've mentioned uh, BNP, obviously a French firm, and, you know, you've got some of the other ones. Are you doing anything with China? That's, you know, obviously you've got Ant Financial coming in with MoneyGram. Are there any of the, the you know, the China, I mean, what, what are you doing as far as, you know, liaising with the established players, the entrepreneurs inside China? Absolutely. So, you know, uh, as a matter of fact, about two years ago, we began opening up offices in China. So now we have eight or maybe even nine after the turn of this week locations that are strewn about, both ranging from family offices for investment opportunities as well as full-fledged accelerator and co-working spaces. So very active there. We've got uh, the very similar kind of corporate program, a lot of opportunity for tech transfer. So in fact, that's often the hotbed for which many of our startups, if they're successful in both um, the U.S. Or, or Europe, will look to kind of expand their company. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly very different, I'd say, paradigm as it relates to both financial regulation as well as adoption for some of these technologies. So, for example, we've seen orders of magnitude greater activity in mobile payments and mobile payment ubiquity compared to the United States. Uh, arguably, there are also generations beyond us just from a payment terminal perspective. So there, there's a lot of activity there. I mean, in the, in the past, I'd say, 12 months, I think two out of those four quarters China, as a location, has garnered the most amount of financial technology investment. And, and certainly, you know, as we watch, I think, how most of these government agencies are responding to financial technology innovation, the, the Chinese government has, has very keenly, and I'd say very correctly, positioned themselves to make it a very, I'd say, permissionless innovation-like environment for, for the entrepreneur. So I'm very envious and jealous of that kind of <laughs> uh, opportunity because it, it's very difficult here dealing with you know, five government agencies, a state agency, and so forth. There's a lot of challenges in building technology. Right. No, that's that's for sure. And uh, I think, you know, what's one of the one of the weaknesses I think that we have here in the U.S. is our is our regulatory regime, where we have not just the federal government, all those agencies. I mean, we've got many many agencies. Every fintech company has to you know, pay attention to, but we also have the states, and sometimes they're dealing with multiple state agencies. It's it, it can be quite challenging, but. Anyway, I want to move on. We're running out of time, and I really want to get to these last couple of points here. And that's, you know, what do you look for in a startup? I mean, you said you've got 
you know, over a thousand companies applying and, and, and only a small percentage actually makes the cut. So how do you decide who makes the cut? Sure. So I think, you know, there's the, the, the very obvious questions that we'll ask. I mean, for us, we don't want to put a startup that's maybe got two people in idea in a garage with their dog in front of the CEO of Chase Bank. Um, <laughs> so, I, so I think there's some pretty, you know, cookie cutter kind of archetype requirements that we have for those to participate in our vertical program. Um, so with that being said, first and foremost, some sort of alpha or beta product. Ideally, a startup is going to have a team that, you know, has raised a little bit of a seed round, has some sort of live product, maybe one or two paying customers. But at this point, we're really, from an industry perspective, a business accelerator. The, the challenge there, again, is, you know, getting back to the time issue, most banks will not be able to convert anything within less than 12 months. And so, you know, for us, the, the challenge is uh, expediting the decisioning process through that 90-day turnaround as the startups here on site in the Valley or in one of our other locations. And so when we build out kind of the pipeline for the startup, you know, that's the first thing that we're trying to do is set expectation in, in, in staying, you know, you may have five or six meetings with this team, with this corporate over the next three months. It doesn't mean anything will be shown for, but, you know, try and drill down to that decision that says, you know, these are the steps required. Here's your path to success startup. And then secondarily, you know, we, we kind of touched on it earlier is the fact that we are a community. I'm a startup myself. And so, you know, to the end for which, you know, our startups that are working in blockchain at this moment have to deal with things like MSB licensing or custody requirements. We have a great number of folks that have dealt with this exactly. In fact, some of the folks at Lending Club uh, just a few years ago had to shut down to get that correct MSB licensing. So you can imagine that kind of experience and insight as delineated from a prior startup to one of those in the current batch. Um, that's really helpful. So we, we try to look for folks that um, not only you know, are looking to build a product, but bring with them and have kind of this network uh, focus. Um, because at the end of the day, that's what the critical mass is here in this building. 450 startups, about 100 corporate partners, and thousands of people walking through the doors every day. So, so number one is just the startup has to fit a certain mold, has to be able to actually engage and build a product with a large corporate. The second, I think, big area for which we vet is really through the actual platform. And so as you might imagine, if 35 out of the 40 partners I have are very excited about a solution, it's a probably good indicator for an investment opportunity for us. Good signal as the industry needs this particular product. So we'll use the actual industry as a means to diligence the, the startup. We may invest during, prior, or after, or not at all in the program itself. And, and from that, the feedback, as you might imagine, is uh, it's incredible. So the most important thing as well is in, in doing so, we bring leverage back to the startup, back to the founder. So instead of the startup going after, well, say, Pepsi and Coke and, and Coke being the only one interested and not really you know, having any leverage to be able to, to push one against the other, you know, we've got 30 or 40 of these folks that are competitively looking for these solutions to build moats in their respective markets. So we want a startup that comes through understanding that from the get-go, you know, their goal and their outcome that we're all seeking is for them to gain traction and to gain traction by way of a large entity. And so that also indicates kind of a top-down approach. So we're looking for startups that have product, but also have a business model and approach to market that understands the channels for which we've built out here. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the last driver is just having had experience in the industry, kind of your standard angel vetting mechanism of, does this person know what they're talking about and do they have the experience and the chops to be able to deliver what they're trying to build? Okay. So I'm curious about like the quality of startups that are coming across your desk. I mean, obviously you're getting, you're getting quantity. Is the quality changing? Is it improving? I mean, are you looking at so many great companies now? It's super hard to, to choose the ones to make the cut or, or is you seeing that, you know, there's really majority of companies are these like two founders in a garage who just aren't, aren't ready for prime time. Could you give us a sense of the quality and how that has changed? How's it changing over time? Sure. Well, I mean, I think, you know, like any, any business, I'd, I'd like to think that our startups and the, and the folks involved in our community have gotten better over time. And I think we've gone, you know, done a better job of making more value, um, building more value for the startup. So to that end, yes, over the past, I'd say, six batches, we've certainly seen an increase in both quality. And we would measure that by not only kind of the ancillary investors that are involved in these startups, but also just like the, the cut of cloth for which they're coming from. So for example, companies like CCO Box that, that we work with, you know, the, this is the, the founder is the prior head of payments for Facebook project. And, you know, those, those kinds of indicators are really important as it may relate to, you know, how successful the startup understands 
their path to market and what are the required kind of boxes they'll need to check. So, you know, we've had companies that have had founders that have had, you know, multiple unicorns. So a great example of that is Steve Kirsch from Token, who's raised their Series A as of about six or seven months ago. Collectively, of the 150 startups uh, they've raised since February 2015, nearly half a billion dollars. We've seen nearly 400 million saved collectively across all of our partners. So I think, you know, the quality of the company that's coming through recognizes that, you know, this is not just your kind of standard run-of-the-mill accelerator program. This is a business accelerator meant for business acceleration. And so there's not a lot of, uh, you know, windows or alcohol happy hour kind of things. It's really (laughs) about just getting stuff done and you know, making the most out of the 90 days that we set them up here in the Valley. Right. Okay. Last question. I'm sure there's lots of, you know, fintech entrepreneurs who are listening to this right now. What is the best way to approach you uh, to get on your radar? So it's really simple. Shoot me a note, scott at pnptc.com. We have a great team, 20 folks on my team uh, that are decentralized. They're spread across the world. They're in Tokyo, Singapore, Hong Kong, Indonesia, France, Germany, you name it. So if you're looking to enter the U.S. market or another market where we might have a, a way to help, we'd love to, to look at your inbound. Typically, we just ask that, yeah, you send me a note, uh, attach all the information that is non-proprietary, so an overview deck without your secret sauce, what you're looking for, some of your asks, and we'll set up a meeting here or, or elsewhere. But yeah, please just uh, know that I get a lot of inbound, so I'll do my, do my best to return the email. Right. Okay. Well, on that note, we'll have to leave it there. I really appreciate you coming on the show today, Scott. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure, and it's always humbling uh, to, to be able to speak to someone like you, Peter. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks. See ya. All right. Bye-bye. You know, after talking with Scott, I was really struck by one thing, and that is how much support there is today for entrepreneurs, fintech entrepreneurs especially, to help them get their business off the ground, make the right connections, and really even help facilitate sales into some of the the largest companies uh, in the world. And the fact that entrepreneurs don't have to do this alone like they did 10 or 20 years ago, but there is an established ecosystem, a support system to help them become successful. It bodes very well, I think, for the future of entrepreneurship, particularly in the fintech space. And I think it bodes well for the country as new ideas are getting nurtured and good ideas are rising to the top. And we're going to see, as I've said before, so much innovation over the next five years, and it's going to be exciting to watch. And companies like Plug and Play are really in the thick of it, really helping to make this future a reality. Anyway, on that note, I will sign off. I very much appreciate you listening, and I will catch you next time. Bye. Today's podcast was sponsored by Fundrise. Fundrise is the first private market real estate investment platform available to everyone that is accredited and non-accredited investors. I've been investing myself since 2015, and we had the CEO of Fundrise, Ben Miller, on the podcast back in episode 110. You can begin with as little as $500. Go to www.fundrise.com slash lendacademy to find out more.